of a Roman court? Um, uh, what's the word? Negating uh, them? Um, oh, rebutting the presumptions of the 12 uh, items of the Roman court. Would that be advisable? I, I, I feel that the, the 12 presumptions themselves cover such a wide area. I'm not too sure if if that can be covered in a single document without falling into the mistake we mentioned earlier, which was, you know, everything in the kitchen sink. Right. I, I, I actually feel it's very difficult to solve in one document. Um, so that's my feeling. I think, um, I do think, however, you can raise a number of those and rebut a number of those presumptions. But I would, I would uh, suggest that the a motion to dismiss in your case um, would come after you have revoked the power of the attorney, right? Um, and and uh, providing you have um, changed the standing, or at least provided um, almost in effect the the nature that we would call a, a demurra, but uh, challenging the the jurisdiction and presumptions that they still. Uh, believe are in place. If we, and I don't quite, I'm not 100% certain yet what is the public form, but I believe you need you need to obviously have done the revocation of the public defender mm-hmm. in your case. Yep. Then you need to at least have demonstrated a change in the status. Okay. Okay, and then you're ready to go dismiss. Okay. Yeah? Got it. All right. So I, I think I think that is. Otherwise, I feel that you're overstretching. Yeah? Yep. Yep. Okay. okay. Um, all right, Ron. Thanks. Anything else? No. I'll, if I think, right. I'll call it back. All right. Okay. Bye. Bye. Uh, I'll keep going on answering these questions in the chat. And look, thanks very much, Ron. And thanks for everyone who, who are calling in. If I'm a bit slow on getting on the line, it's just... Uh, making sure I can get through these. Um, the question uh, is raised from Guest 7. Guest 7 is asking a few questions here. The question is, uh, are there any going to be any holidays associated with Acadia? Uh, yes, there will be. Um, I, I think that this is something that will happen at a local community and at a province and at a university level. What they are, when they are, I think that's up for others and other groups later down the road to... Um, decide and discuss. Um, the question here, and, and guest seven, you're on a roll here. Uh, the question is about a writ um, called uh, Dum Furt Infra A Tartum, which is uh, a writ associated with, uh, from memory, uh, with infants. And it is about deprivation of rights of infants and the right to deprivate rights of infants. It has, I believe, some uh, context in justifying guardianship in their system. Uh, In answer to your question, I haven't done enough work yet in researching it, but I wouldn't be surprised if it is part vindication to what we have been saying that at birth they make us a ward and then, of course, uh, at the age of seven declare us uh, intestate uh, in that relationship. So the the flesh becomes a ward. Uh, They declare us um, dead, intestate, and that these presumptions, this uh, particular writ, dum fuit, Infra aid tartum probably has a key part to play. Uh, as we know more, as I have been able to research some more and get feedback, I look forward to basically adding that in and, and being able to explain that in more precise detail. Look, I see Alpha 999 is back on. I'll keep going through the written questions, but I want to get on to Alpha 999 and then uh, we'll come back to the other questions. Hello, Alpha 999, can you hear us? Hi, Frank. Hi, how you I, going? You know, I, I hung up the phone last time accidentally. That's right. Uh, the question that I, I had here is about um, 
the internet is where we're getting our contact here. What happens if the internet is cut down or otherwise censored? Uh, is there some provision in place to keep in contact with members, or what 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 plan is in place for that? I I have not made it a, a, a kind of a uh, a prerequisite, but I I would hope and trust that within the structure within the legal structure of forming a campus, it is in fact a requirement of a campus to obtain an electronic copy of all the material of Eucadia as a time capsule. That is the first primary goal of a, of a campus, is to preserve the information. Make sense? Yeah. And then so. from that then is to build a community. Now that, that means the material needs to be in a format that can be obtained. Um, so I'd suggest to you that once once the communities start to be formed through the workbenches and you can actually download from Amazon the large files or get them through CD-ROM and exchange them. I know a number of people have started to, Ron, who you heard on the call before, actually has been doing dumps onto CD-ROM and has been able to give people copies of material at a snapshot. Um, so I believe that is the best safety mechanism to guarantee despite potential loss of the internet or censorship or something else that the material has a life of its own. Does that answer your concern? Yeah, that does, yeah. yeah. That was one of the things I was wondering about. Thanks. That's good for now. All right. Okay, Thank thanks, you. Alfred. Bye. Yeah, bye. Um, okay, I've got the next question on the call here and then we'll go back to those that want to have a chat. Uh, so I'll get through them quickly, um, or as quick as I can. Uh, I've been, uh, this is from to, uh, Toth, or to the. I've been reading the law books on the court site a little bit. How do I best suggest changes on the university site forums or elsewhere? At the moment, um, I'd ask you to, to load them on the forums of uh, University of Eucadia um, in terms of suggestions. But when the workbenches are up, I'm hoping that there is a more formalised means of debating and exchanging, uh, and in fact, direct editing that will be available to uh, teams in terms of improving the uh, documents um, that's coming in, in the short term. Have a look at University of Ukadia as, as an immediate way of expressing your opinions and ideas. All changes are uh, gratefully um, accepted, uh, all recommendations I say gratefully accepted uh, because this is a model and all those changes are needed. It, it, it is a collective and an open source. Um, I'm going to go to the callers and we'll come back again. Uh, I'll go to, um, just go to, uh, here we go, um, uh, uh, to Dennis from again. Oh, one sec. I'll be get there. Okay. And I'll get through the callers. Here we go. Hopefully. I mute. There we go. Dennis from. Can you hear us? Yes, Frank. Hi. Okay. Um, another question, real quick. Um, yep. In terms of uh, court procedure, I, uh, you know, we've been reading the canons and thought I'd test, try to test some of the assertions by calling like local uh, DA, county courts, and so forth, and asking them a yep. simple question, what type of law does the court operate under? And I really got a runaround. And yep. I also know, Mike, I actually had two questions, which I never got the answer to either. One, under what type of law are you operating? Two, um, where are the rules of procedure, you know, that explain, you know, this system of law? And I, and I haven't gotten an answer. Could you just briefly discuss that? Sure. Um, Thank you. They, uh, they call the form of the law lex formis um, and they call the, um, the, the procedure and then the, the law, if you like, of the court, uh, the other one is lex loci, L-O-C-I. Um, it's a fancy way of, of uh, basically using a bit of Latin and then making up what they like. Um, it is defined in statute and it is defined in, in um, in uh, training, but as far as getting a clear picture, it, it is open-ended. Because the system itself 
changes depending upon the nature of it. Is it a um, is it a commercial matter? Is it a criminal matter? Or well, obviously all matters are criminal, but there's slightly differences there. Then the different nature of the of the matter. Is it a court of equity? Uh, is it uh, dealing with contracts? It, it it does change, and within that too, they um, introduce certain differences of procedure. Some of it deals with the evidence, some of it deals with trust law, some of it deals with perfecting jurisdiction. So there are different elements and, uh, that they bring into play and not every jurisdiction uses exactly the same procedure, which is frustrating when you want to share knowledge, for example, from Australia to the United States or from the United States to the United Kingdom or from the United Kingdom to Canada for that matter. It, it does make the portability of knowledge diff difficult which is another reason why I believe what we were saying before about the principles, understanding the principles being key, because if one focused purely on trying to, to learn their procedure, their procedure continues to change, and they, will, uh, they have over time, if you look at the history, and Blacks is a great way of looking at it, because the definitions are an intrinsic part of procedure. And when you look at Blacks' different versions, you see... The definitions keep changing on key words. So good luck to finding answers to those questions. I don't think you'll ever get them. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. Thank you. Very good explanation. Okay. Thank you. Good on you. Uh, I'll keep going on the uh, on the callers. So I'm just going to go to the next caller here before I go back to the questions. Thanks for your patience, everybody. I'll go to East Pennsylvania here. I'm just I'm meeting East Pennsylvania. Can you hear us? Diego, how are you doing? Going well. Uh, uh, one question, which is a rarity for me. Uh, <laughs> mineral rights. I own the mineral rights on my property. Right. If they're, if they, I believe that that is a, a secondary because I had to go through a secondary signing for the mineral rights. Okay. Uh, if they, say they would come take my house from me, I would still have the mineral rights to it. I have to sign away the mineral rights, and I have a mining license, so they they couldn't really do that because it had to be signed to a, a person with a license, which there's not too many of them. But uh, yeah, uh, technically, do I have them over the barrel? But I, I'm you know not really you know in that in that situation right now. But will I have them over the barrel or owning the mineral rights? Well, yeah, I mean the, the thing about mineral rights. Um, it, it, the concept of mineral rights didn't emerge till the California gold rush and it actually came out and I'm trying to think of the word there's a particular word um, and it's not, not suffrage but because that's dealing with, with right to vote but there's a particular word that was used in the distinction of water rights that was used as the legal fiction to create the idea that the rights to dig up the land was separate to the right of tenancy. And their argument was the effectively the right of first use. Now, mineral rights are a funny one because mineral rights is effectively a, an enclosure that is a, an enclosure of right, a privatisation of right, that has no provenance in the history of law. There is no foundation to mineral rights. It is a, a legal presumption that seems to have been carried through without anyone going back to the first principles and saying there is no provenance in common law, feudal law, Anglo-Saxon law, in Byzantine law, in Roman law, Christian law, any law to this concept. It merely appears to have validity because they have created the incorporation of, uh, of each uh, region to be administered um, under bankruptcy. So I would love to see this whole area of mineral rights contested as really an area that has no clothes. But uh, do they have you on a barrel? Uh, do you, sorry, do you have them on a barrel? I think you have them on a barrel and a lot of things, right? <laughs> well, uh, um, this is one of them. Yeah, well, see, I'm licensed also, so 
it would have to be the only way they can get the only way.